you play to win the game. You play to win the game. You play to win the game. Who said that? Herman Edwards. Herman Edwards. Who's Herman Edwards? Some of y'all know. Probably about half of y'all know. Herman Edwards is now the head coach of Arizona State University football. He's been with ESPN for a good while as a football commentator. One of those hard-nosed, old-school old school guys. Um, had like a 10-year career in the NFL as a defensive back. Most of the years he played for the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, coached the Jets, where he was famous for saying, You play to win the game. Hmm. Uh, I imagine uh, those players at Arizona State University are grateful for the brick, because I bet you it's hard to play for that man. He's a tough guy, very tough guy. Um, I always play with, famous for playing with a Motor, never letting up on a play. <sighs> there are some exceptions to you play to win the game. And we here in Memphis are all too um, familiar with that recently with the Grizzlies. After the grit and grind uh, era came to uh, a couple years premature end, I believe, because of the um, resources dedicated to the contract of one Chandler uh, Shankoon Parsons. Um, we made a trade for, I guess it was Zach Randolph, I think, who went to the Kings, right? And then in return, we got uh, uh, Tyreek Evans. We know him. He played for a year at Memphis, last year of Calipari's head coach. Well, I mean, at the University of Memphis, last year Calipari's tenure. There, when during that um, second round game, we were obviously not playing to win the game because he was about to, he was trying to get to Kentucky as fast as possible. Uh, so. Uh, Tyreek won Rookie of the Year in the NBA the next year. Coincidentally, the second Memphis Tiger point guard, uh, because Derrick Rose um, won it the year before, second Tiger point guard to win Rookie of the Year in the NBA. Uh, Derrick Rose doing it in 2009, Tyreek Evans doing it in 2010. So... Anyway, Tyreek was kind of a throw-in, I guess, to this trade. We let off Zach Randolph. Um, and um, there was a problem. We were trying to tank the season. So what you do is you basically trade away good players. You don't play the, your players that you, a lot of good players you do have. For example, so we had Tyreek Evans in the near the bottom of the rotation. He didn't do very much before because he was uh, he had been injured a lot for the pre prior years. So he came back to Memphis and he was turning back the clock. Um, oh, I just did something I shouldn't do in the COVID, COVID situation, you know, touch my face. But um, anyway, uh, so yeah, he was playing very well and the Tigers weren't losing um, in that 20... Uh, 17 2018 campaign, which I believe was uh, where it was Dylan Brooks's rookie year. He's now a third year, uh, doing very well at shooting guard, I believe. Um, uh, well, up until when they were uh, when we had to abruptly end the season playing in the back court with John Morant, uh, in the starting lineup. Now, um, so yeah, we weren't. We were obviously trying to tank, and Tyreek was shelved because he wasn't good for the tanking project. 
because he was just playing like he was when he was a rookie in first year. But um, anyhow, um, what is the game we're in? Of course, it's the coronavirus, so we're trying to get rid of it and starve it away and, you know, uh, have least of us uh, uh, come down with it. So the latest statistics are from the Memphis Shelby County Health Department are that uh, 2,040 odd people have been identified as, as having contracted the coronavirus, which is up 37 from yesterday. So we seem to have the upper hand, only 37. Right now, almost as many people uh, ha have recovered as have contracted it altogether. So, that's very encouraging. We're talking about a difference of like 100 people or so. Um, so, about 45% of the people who have ever had it have already recovered. About, you know, unfortunately about a couple percent have died. And the rest... Um, you know, are an active case. So if you ever, if you are part of that 2040, you either still have it, have died, or have recovered. So, the bell curve I talk about, well, let me try to get my finger within view, that goes like this over time, or to you, like this, right? goes like this for you guys. Okay. Um, that bell curve uh, represents number of active cases. Number of active cases. Number of people who currently have it. Because the number of cases keep going up and up and up and up. Number of ever, uh, you know, indefinitely. Uh, those don't come down. They only go up or just stay at whatever historical max it is. Um, but um, so this bell curve has six segments. I will posit six segments to it, like I promised before. The first part is the first tail where you have just a little bit of cases, like we were in as a nation in the first couple of weeks of March, with only like one, two, five, like, you know, 12, 100 or so. Then all of a sudden, halfway up the increase in slope, or 45 degrees, whichever is greater, right here is the end of the first segment. It accelerates quickly where it starts to flatten out, and the slope is halfway to flat. That's the second segment. We're in that now as a country. In Memphis, we may have leveled off, and gone to the third segment, which is halfway over from this inflection to the peak, okay? Or it's kind of rounding off to the peak. The fourth segment is where we're kind of starting to, starting to see declines in the number of active cases. In other words, people are recovering and new cases are not coming in as fast as people are recovering. And then the fifth part is a rapid decline in active cases until there's an inflection point on the bottom, which is opposite the second part of the curve from before where you see the rapid increase. And so what, on this point of inflection down here is where the tail starts, where you have it flattening out to, no, to almost nothing. The point of what this exercise, this, this communal sacrifice, is to get all the way over to the other side. Now, back in 1918... 
people were sick of obviously wearing a mask and distancing, you know, with the Spanish flu that uh, that was um, going on near the end of the World War One. So when we saw that rapid rapid decline of cases, we're in stage five of six. Before we let the foot off the gas. And we had victory parades and celebrations and blah, blah, blah. And many more times as many people died from the second wave. Why? Because you, you had a lot of gatherings where you replaced distancing with a lot of gathering. At a high point in the curve declining but yet a high base number and you established a new curve you established new parameters and you established a new upward trajectory like a like that look like a, a skewed w or an m with one little one segment bigger than the on the right bigger than the one on the left and uh i think as a country we we risk that we actually risk, we haven't gotten to the peak yet, so we, ri we risk establishing a new probable peak way out in the future. Why? Because they opened the beaches. They opened the, uh, they're opening the state of Georgia. Like the eighth most popular state in the country, populous state in the country. Um... You think South Dakota's going to get it bad? <laughs> Georgia's going to get it bad. And they might um, kind of undermine work we're doing here in Memphis. It's not like we don't have people from Georgia passing by here. I know it's eight hours away or seven hours away, but still, you know. <laughs> a lot of us know a lot of people from Georgia and vice versa. Especially when shit goes down over there. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then, uh, Bill Lee, uh, from Tennessee, in rural Tennessee, we've, we're in the first part, people who have yet to catch it have not yet caught it, so they're in the first part, so they're going to accelerate their walk up to the, to the, to the, to the high, uh, high contagion part of the curve in rural parts of Tennessee. That's tough. That's definitely not playing to win the game. <sighs> I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna throw out something at you that is gonna make y'all some some kind of citizens of the world. We in the United States are in a league in competition. Obviously for COVID-19, we're losing badly. We've got almost a third of the um, of the people ever tested positive. A third. We're like 31% of known cases worldwide. We got 4.5% of the population. That's bad government and bad policy, if there ever was one. Um, so, who are we in league with? We're in the league with... 36 other countries that make up a membership called the OECD. When we talk about major countries, when we talk about our peer countries, we're talking about the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. This is a club, let's say, of nations that um, compare policies and compare outcomes. The point is, 
good government, good outcomes. It used to be defined as uh, maximizing income. Now, if you look at the, the new charters and strategic plans of the OECD and OECD.org, you see that they are the secretary of the uh, OECD is looking at um, implementing policies that help well-being of citizens. In other words, not that you make it a lot of money. I mean, we know people who make a lot of money and are miserable. All right. Okay. In other words, they're going away from they're going for other indicators of well-being. Let's say you know lifespan. Let's say uh, whether or not you die of a certain thing, like uh, uh, mental illness or heart problems or something like that. You know that those things are coming in to the radar of the OECD. Um, and uh, these publications for the OECD, they are. Surprisingly, you can see them online, uh, well distilled, clear, um, digestible, legible, understandable, and uh, they're very rigorous on the back end. You want to become a knowledge of how well we're doing as a country compared to other countries? Read some of this OECD stuff. Now, uh, our problems with the coronavirus point to one thing that the OECD has come up with during its 20, November 2019 publication on health expenditures. Coincidentally, a 20 November 2019 publication on health expenditures. Uh, it wasn't just because Bernie Sanders said it. One out of every six dollars we spend, one out of every six we spend goes to health care, medical care, something like that, right? Come on. What do we get for it? We don't get the biggest life expectancies. We don't get the best health literacy. We don't get the avoidance. We get high obesity rates. We don't get the avoidance of other... Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm guilty of that too, though. Um, but uh, way number one, not in health... We're number one in a lot of things, but we're number one in health expenditures.